We often just try to leave room for various things in our lives, like creamer in our coffee, events on our calendar, and space in our garage. But leaving room doesn't guarantee we will end up with enough creamer, the right events, or enough space. What if, instead of just leaving room, we actively make room for the important things and for what truly matters? Well, good morning. It's good to see you. Are you warm? Yeah. Man, we're so glad that you're here on this chilly Sunday. And for uh, those of you who are joining us online, who are underneath the covers or the blankets, we see you too. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. And uh, we're in a message series called Make Room. There's a big difference between leaving room and making room. Last week, we talked about making room for the new. And if we're going to embrace the new in our life, we have to let go of the old. We have to let go here to grab on here. And sometimes that's easy when we talk about maybe letting go of a hurt, a habit, or a hang up. But I really challenged this last week, like, let go of the easy, the known, the comfortable to grab on to the new. I also challenge you uh, to 28 days of prayer and fasting. We're going to be in this message series for 28 days. Uh, and so I hope if you were with us last week that you have found what it is you're fasting from, that you've been praying with us, and also reading through the book of Acts. We're reading a chapter of Acts each day. If you want a prayer prompt that goes along with that, just pull out your phone right now and text the word ACTS to the church phone number 806 745 0595. You'll get a daily prompt every day, just prompting you to pray on that chapter of Acts. We are in Acts chapter 8 today, so if you haven't done that with us for the week and you want to catch up, we would love to have you join in. This morning, we're going to be taking, uh, talking about making room for real relationships. All right, so it may get a little uncomfortable for you if the person you're seated next to is not a real relationship. That's a, that's a joke. You can laugh at that. So talking about making room for real relations, so we're going to be in Mark chapter two. So you can go ahead and turn there. Uh, but while you're getting there, uh, because we're talking about relationships, I thought it would be good to talk about one of the things on this entire planet that is the most socially awkward when it comes to relationships. And that is an elevator. Anybody with me on this? Like, think about it. You get into this metal box suspended by cables that go up and down to take you up and down a building with complete total strangers. What could be more awkward than that, right? And so what I thought I would do, let me just see who's in the room. Who is like me and you do it the right way? That's funny too. You can joke. You can laugh at that. Who gets into an elevator, goes to the back corner and keeps to yourself? Okay, I just want you to know you do it the right way. Who gets in the elevator and goes, group hug? Like, that's the wrong, yeah, that's wrong, right? Like, it's just wrong. In fact, to show you how wrong it is, um, I put together a list of elevator commandments. The Bible has 10 commandments. Um, I gave you 12 elevator commandments. Jesus had 12 disciples, so go with it, all right? 12 elevator commandments. Number one, press the up or down button once. Pressing it 10 times doesn't make the elevator arrive any faster, okay? Press it once and know which way you're going. Number two, follow the two-flight rule. If you're physically able to take the stairs for one flight, please do so, right? Number three, once the elevator arrives and the doors open, please wait till everyone on board has exited before you enter. Amen, right? Uh, number four, if the elevator is full... Just wait for the next one. Don't cram on to the elevator. Uh, I don't think y'all are finding these as amusing as I find them. <laughs> next, hold the door open for those in the immediate proximity, not those who are walking one mile away and will arrive there in 10 minutes. Uh, next, push or request your floor button promptly. You should already know where you're going before you step onto the elevator. Find a comfortable space respecting others' social space. Is this not the most awkward thing in an elevator, other than the communication part that we'll get to in just a second? Like, I really, I'm an introvert, but like when three people get on an elevator, there's four corners, there's room for all of us, right? 
get out of my personal space, okay? All right, next. Um, keep arms and hands and baggage and other items to yourself at all times, please. Next, always face the doors. Because it's just creepy when someone gets onto an elevator and stares at you this way when everybody else is staring. Am I right about this? Right? Like, this just, it's just awkward and creepy. Maintain minimal, this is for all the introverts in the room. Maintain minimal eye contact and minimal conversation. Are you that guy that has the conversation with everybody in the elevator? Note to self, never get on the elevator with that guy. Not just the elevator. Uh, this one goes next to that. Please keep phone conversations private. I think I'm stepping on some toes. Last one. Exit politely. If you're at the back, wait till everyone in front of you gets off. Okay? All right. The reason I gave you those 12 commandments is because the elevator can be one of the most socially awkward places. And I think oftentimes in our life, our relationships are socially awkward. Here's what I mean by that. I think God has so much more for us than what we're experiencing in our relationships. In fact, it's been said, so I'm going to say it here. Show me your friends... I'll show you where you're headed in life. And, and we need so much more in our life than awkward elevator relationships. Which is why I want us to go to Mark chapter 2. Mark's gospel, if you're not familiar with it, he just jumps right into Jesus' ministry, okay? Matthew, Luke, there's a couple of chapters of the East, uh, Easter Christmas story, uh, jumping into Je but Mark just jumps right into Jesus' ministry. In Mark chapter 2, he tells the story. It's one of my favorite stories out of the Gospels. It was the story that I preached my very first sermon at Aldersgate from. I love this story. And so I want to read it all, and then we're going to come back and, and look at it for just a little bit. Mark chapter 2, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. It says, And when he, Jesus, returned to Capernaum, after some days it was reported that he was at home. We're not sure whose home this was. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, listen to this, y'all, this is crazy. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, that'll freak you out, won't it? Why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this story. And God, today we just thank you that this is your inspired word written by Mark through your inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that this word is the authority over our lives. And God, today we don't want to just hear the word. We want to obey the word. We want to do the word. And so would you just speak to us what this means to us today about relationships? Take me out of the way and speak to each one of us about where we're at in this place in our lives. We offer it up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want you to do something for me. I want you to visualize this story. Like in your mind's eye. I, I want you to picture these four friends carrying their paralyzed friend on a stretcher 
and arriving at the space, the place where Jesus was at. Like in your mind, what does that look like? I'm gonna put up on the screen an artist uh, rendering of, of this scene, but, but it really is not the whole scene because it zooms in to what was happening in the room and what was happening at Jesus' feet. I want you to back up as you visualize this. I, I want you to back up to what the four men saw when they arrived at the place. Because the scripture tells us there was no room in the house. So there was a crowd, scripture uses the word crowd. There was a crowd outside the house. I want you to envision in your mind them arriving at this place with all of these people crowding outside the house. Mark talked a lot about the crowds when it came to Jesus. In fact, over 40 times in Mark's gospel, he mentions the crowd. And when he mentions the crowd, he talks about how Jesus had compassion on the crowd and, and, and how uh, Jesus would teach and preach to the crowd. But there's never in the Gospel of Mark, 40 occurrences of the crowd, there's never any mention of the crowd finding repentance and turning to Jesus. In fact... Most of the time when Mark talks about the crowd in his gospel, he talks about how the crowd kept people who were trying to get to Jesus from getting to Jesus, as is the case in Mark chapter 2. And that's what originally the four men saw when they walked up onto the place where Jesus was teaching. And then here on this artist rendering, you see the room. Okay, you see where people are gathered and they're listening to Jesus. The scripture tells us he was preaching from the word and they were there. So that means they got there early and got room. Maybe they were a guest of honor to whoever's house it was. Maybe they had a really good friend who saved them a seat. Somehow they got into the room. It's interesting that in Mark chapter 2, the two Greek words he used are so similar, crowd and room. The Greek word for crowd is oklos. The Greek word for room or gathering in a room is oikos. Mark is trying to make a point here. And there was this gathering in this room, and even then they couldn't get into the room. And so these friends went up on the roof, began to make a hole in the roof, and lowered their paralyzed friend in front of Jesus. Now, most roofs in first century homes were made out of hay or straw or something like that. So perhaps it wasn't a formidable task as much as we would think it is today. But nonetheless, they weren't going to be content with turning around and going home. They were going to get their friend to Jesus. I want you to think about this for a second. The only reason we have the story in the gospel is because of these four friends. If it wasn't for these four friends, we wouldn't even know this story. My question to you and I this morning is, do we have friends like that? Friends that are getting us to Jesus. Oh, and let's look at the other side of that. Do we have friends in our life that we are getting to Jesus? I love the scripture, Mark chapter 2, verse 5. It says, Jesus looked up and saw their faith. Most of the time when there's a healing in the Gospels, there may be a comment by the gospel writer that someone was healed because of their faith. But in this case, the man is healed because of their faith. That's a big difference. And the whole point of the message today is we need relationships like that. And we need to be in relationships where we're bringing people to Jesus like that. Do we have that in our lives? And if we do, those are real relationships. The crowd, those in the room, those four friends. 
John Wesley was the founder, father of the Methodist movement. And, and Wesley approached the Methodist movement very much like what we see in Mark chapter 2 in terms of the crowd, the room, and those four friends. In fact, it, I'm going to put some concentric circles up on the screen for you, but here's Wesley's movement in the Methodist church. Here's what he did. He, he started with this outer circle that he called a conference. That was like the biggest group of people, okay? So here at Aldersgate, we are part of the Global Methodist Church, and we are part of the West Plains Conference. The West Plains Conference extends all the way from farming to New Mexico, southwest Colorado, Oklahoma, down to Vernon, over to Odessa and Midland, Abilene, Odessa, Midland, and back up. That's a big conference, is it not? Like geographically, that's a big territory. I don't know how many churches now. I think it's something up to close to 200 churches in that area. That is the conference. Beneath the conference, Wesley called them societies, and these were the gatherings of churches, okay? So those almost 200 churches in the conference, each one of them would be, in Wesley's mind, a society. And the society met regularly in a large gathering like we're doing here this morning. But then beneath that society, there was this class, and what Wesley wanted was for each society to be broken down into smaller classes, maybe 12, 15, 20, 25 people. But there was a smaller grouping of people beyond this society and beyond this conference. And then even deeper than the class, he called it the band. And in Wesley's mind, this is where real relationships existed. And this is where real discipleship happened. I told you last week. We believe every believer is a disciple, and every disciple is called to make disciples. And Wesley would tell you this did not happen at the conference level. It did not happen at the society level. It did not happen at the class level. It happened at the band level. And a band was a small group of three, four, maybe five people. They were all the same sex, and they were completely open and vulnerable with you. The first question they asked everyone each time they met was, how is it with your soul? We are created in three dimensions. We're created with a physical body, a spirit that connects us with God, and a soul, the deepest part of who we are, our will, our mind, and our emotions. The band meets regularly and asks one another, how is it with your mind? and your emotions, and the decisions you're making in life. So like for me, for example, like I'm part of the West Plains Conference, right? The society I belong to is Aldersgate Church, which hello, you do too if you're here this morning, right? Beneath that, I have a class. What I would consider my class here is the church staff, right? Like that's the people that I hang out with the most in class. Uh, also on Wednesday mornings, I have a, a group of men that we meet together at United on uh, Milwaukee and 4th Street. Any of you are invited there, 6.30. I show up at 6.45, so it's fine if you come a little bit late, right? We just have coffee and fellowship. And then beneath that, I have a band. I have a group. There's four of us. Methodist pastors, we meet regularly, and that's the first question we ask each other each time we meet is, how is it with your soul? Where do you see yourself in this movement? Where, where do you see your relationship circles? Sometimes we're very good at the crowd part. We're very good at the, 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 the class part even. But are we getting to that deepest innermost part that Wesley would refer to as the band. These four, Jesus saw their faith, that's a band. Long before Wesley came up with that, with the Wesley movement, or Methodist movement, uh, there, there was a guy that, uh, he was, his name was Aristotle. Uh, he was a Greek philosopher and even back in his century, he talked about the same exact thing. In fact, I've got another image I'll put up here for you. But Aristotle talked about the, the lowest level or that biggest outer circle. Uh, he referred to those as utility relationships. Utility relationships where I just need to exchange something with you. Like I show up to get a cup of coffee. I have a friendship with the barista. Maybe the same barista every time, but I'm basically just interacting with that barista to get my coffee right? I just finished a book. Well, not I, this past year, I finished a book from Arthur Brooks called From Strength to Strength. It's a fantastic read. The first chapter is the most depressing chapter I've ever read in any book. 
you can get past the first chapter, it's a great read. But here's what Arthur Brooks, he would call that level, he would call that level deal friends. Like we just have a level of relationships in our life where we just make deal, like we're just transactioning with them. We're just trying to get something from one another, right? Uh, that's your elevator friendships. It should be. Don't be going deeper than that on an elevator, right? Just joking. It's these deal friends. And then beyond that, we move to what Aristotle called pleasure friends. And these are friends in our life that we hang out with because we have some kind of common bond. It would be like parents whose kids share a certain activity. And so all the parents hang together uh, because of the kids involved in that activity. Or it would be like golfing buddies that you have or scrapbooking friends that you have. There's these pleasure friends that we hang out with because we share something in common with these pleasure friends. But then Aristotle said there's the deepest level and what he called the deepest level was good friends. I just love that he called it good friends. And what he meant by this is it's no longer deal friends, it's real friends. That's what Arthur Brooks says. Now we're in relationships because we want to challenge one another to be better followers of Jesus. And we need these real friends, these good friends, who will look us in the eye and say, bro, can I speak into you about something? The four men in Mark chapter two, they were good friends. And they were willing to get their friend to Jesus no matter what it took. Again, let me just ask, where are you at? With deal friends, utility friends, pleasure friends, and those real friends that are gonna get you to Jesus regardless of the cost. I, I see this in so many different places in our culture. Let me tell you one place I see it. I see it in recovery groups. Alcoholics Anonymous Celebrate Recovery. Part of the classes we just launched here uh, on Wednesday night what was Celebrate Recovery. We relaunched Celebrate Recovery this past Wednesday, had a great turnout. But that's what happens in recovery groups, right? Like there's this open share group and anybody's invited to the open share group. Anybody can come to the open share group. But sometimes we move from open share to closed share. Like there's a particular addiction that we're dealing with or, or, or we just want a closer, more intimate environment. And so we close the group to a certain a, a group of people or number of people. But then even deeper than that, in any kind of recovery program, you have a sponsor, that one person who knows you better than any of these other people do and will look you in the eye and say, uh-uh. Who will look you in the eye and say, come on, we got to go to a meeting, right? And how do we see that in, in our lives? I, I see this all over the place. And you know why I see it all over the place? Because it's exactly what Jesus did. <laughs> We're doing this by accident a lot of times in our life and we don't even understand it's how Jesus showed us to do it. Like Jesus had this group called the crowds. I've already talked to you about it in Mark almost 40 times. Mark talks about the crowd. Everywhere Jesus went, crowds followed him. Scripture often tells us he tried to get off by himself. But even when he would get off by himself, crowds would come and follow Jesus. There was all these crowds. And then beneath the crowds, Jesus had 72. You can read about this in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, go and study that this week. You'll see that Jesus gathered these 72 and he sent these 72 out. Do you know what the average size church in America is? 75. You know why? Because that's the most one person can effectively lead. Right? And that's, do we see this in Jesus' life? And then beneath those 72, Jesus had 12, the disciples that he handpicked and said, man, come follow me. You're my 12. You're my, you're my disciple. You, so in Wesley's thing, the 72 would be like the, the uh, society. And, and then the 12 would be like the class. And then even deeper than the 12, Jesus had three, Peter, James, and John, that got to see and hear more than any of the other 12 did. That was Jesus' band if you will. Where do you see yourself in the way Jesus modeled relationships for us? In Mark chapter 2, those four friends that brought their fifth friend, the paralyzed man, that was the innermost circle.
how do we move to having those kind of relationships in our life? I want us to look back at Mark chapter 2, and I want to share three things with you just briefly. Let me, before I do that, let me talk about those three. There's this other model, if you will, that we see in Scripture, this, this model beyond the Gospels where we see Paul. Uh, you're going to begin to read about Paul this week if you're following us in Acts. Paul became one of the apostles, one of the disciples who planted the early church, three missionary journeys. You'll read all about that in Acts, planted churches. And everywhere he went and planted a church, he developed people, he invested in people, he grew up people to continue to lead. And so Timothy was one of his protégés, his, his disciples that he invested into. And we find ourselves needing a Paul in our life and a Timothy in our life. That's part of those threes. Like every one of us need a Paul that speaks into us and a Timothy that we speak into. Like, so like in my life, uh, many of you are familiar with Bob Hamp. He comes and preaches here usually once a year. He's a Paul to me. He speaks into my life. I meet with him regularly, and he speaks into me and invests in me. And then I have Timothy's that I speak into. I shared with the Disciples Making Disciples group uh, Wednesday night that I have three of them right now. One of them is Skylar Shroggy. We just sent the Shroggies to southwest Colorado to hopefully plant a church there. Right? And Skylar and I meet regularly, and I invest in him. We need a Paul in our life and we need a Timothy in our life. We also need Barnabases in our life. Barnabases are encouragers. You'll read about Barnabas in Acts as well. Barnabas are encouragers. But listen, if we're honest, I think this is what we've got comfortable with in the church. I think we've gotten very comfortable surrounding ourselves with Barnabases who exhort us and encourage us. But we don't really have a Paul that speaks into us. We don't really have a Timothy that we're speaking into. And, and that, that band, that, that three of Jesus, that's where we find the Paul and Timothy relationships. If we want that, I want to show you from Mark chapter 2, three things really quickly of how we do that. Number one, it must be intentional. Intentional. I wish we had the prequel to Mark chapter 2. Like, I so wish we knew how these friends got to be such great friends. We don't know if this man was paralyzed from birth, if he had some kind of traumatic incident during his life. We don't know exactly how he ended up paralyzed and confined to a stretcher. But let me tell you, it doesn't matter if it was from birth or later in life. It's difficult to make friends when your life is lived on a stretcher. But somehow, this group became those real friends. I so wish we knew how that happened, but I can tell you this, even not knowing, it had to be intentional. We must make room for real relationships. If we just leave room and think we're going to stumble into it, it will never happen. If it does, it's only by the grace of God. Thank God for his grace. Jesus handpicked the 12 and said to James, Peter, and John, come up on the mountain. You'll see me transfigured right before your very eyes. Jesus was intentional. If he was intentional, you and I are going to have to be intentional as well. We're going to have to make room and take steps to get into this level of relationships. Once we decide we're going to be intentional and make room for it, number two, we must be Vulnerable. This friend that laid on a stretcher 24 7 was totally dependent on others for everything. And yet he let his friends. Do that for him. Pick up his mat and carry him to Jesus. Can I just give you a little spoiler alert? We all have a mat. Oh, it all looks differently. 
but we all have a mat and we must be like the man in this story and we must trust those around us enough to show our deepest vulnerability to them. That's how we get past the outer circles to the deepest levels is to begin to be vulnerable and trust people with our brokenness and our flaws and the places we need someone to take us to Jesus. Here's the third thing. We see this in the story. When we get intentional about finding those kind of real relationships, and when we get to the level in our conversation where we can be that vulnerable with people, spiritual growth is inevitable. It's not optional. Look at the story. This guy, they're so intentional about being friends. He shows them his complete vulnerability. They lift him up, take him to Jesus. He doesn't have a lot of choice. They take him to Jesus. They can't get in front of Jesus. They go up on top of the roof, begin to make a hole in the roof, lower their friend before Jesus. He gets to Jesus' feet, and here's what Jesus says. Your sins are forgiven. (laughs) Hello, that's not why I'm here. Like, we just take it for granted when we read the story. He didn't have his friends take him to Jesus so his sins could be forgiven. He He wanted to be able to walk. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Now, Jesus gives him so much more. Uh, Well, how can you get more than your sins being forgiven, right? But he is able to walk. He's physically healed. But there was so much more than just being physically healed. He was spiritually transformed. Can I just be brave enough to say this this morning? My experience has taught me that just because we sit in church doesn't mean we're spiritually transformed. Just because we go to a Sunday school class doesn't mean we're spiritually transformed. But when we get into relationships with three or four people who will look us in the eye and say, how's your soul, bro? Spiritual transformation happens. Who do you have It's taking you to Jesus. And who are you taking to Jesus? We're going to give you some time this morning to just sit with those two questions. In fact, I would love for you to actually write this down. There's something that happens when we take it from here to paper. If you picked up a slap guide this morning when you came in, they're on the table there in the Connections Lounge. If not, we're going to have plenty of space and time. You can go get one of those. If nothing else, just grab uh, one of the Connect cards in the seat there in front of you. You can draw and write on it. Uh, Take your neighbor's hand, draw and write. I don't know, whatever you want to do. But I want you to envision these concentric circles. And I would literally love for you to write down the names of people that you see in each of those circles in your life. We're going to give you plenty of time. Just sit and let the Holy Spirit speak to you and give you names of people. If you have names that are in that inner circle, there should be two, three, maybe four at most. If you have 12 in that inner circle, you have a next step to take. If you have those three or four in that inner circle, then before you leave this room this morning, I would invite you to take out your phone and text them and say, thank you for taking me to Jesus. If you're not there, you know what we say at Aldersgate? It's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. We believe that no matter where you're at on your spiritual journey, there's always a next step to take. And so you spend time with the Holy Spirit this morning asking, how can I take that next step? How can I be intentional? Where do I need to grow my vulnerability with people? Where do I need to see that true life change happen? Because I have friends in my life who are gonna carry me to Jesus and I'm gonna carry them to Jesus. And I trust that the Holy Spirit will speak to you what your next step is in that. We're going to sing. The altar's open. 
So God, we surrender this time to you right now. Help us make room for real relationships in our life. God, I pray for those in the room right now and those online that when they view this picture of Mark chapter two and Jesus looks up and says he sees their faith, that God, they know the names of those people. They see the faces of those people staring down at Jesus. And God, right now in this space, in this time, I pray that they would pick up the phone or go to them in person and say, thank you, thank you, thank you for taking me to Jesus. God, in our mind's eye, when we envision Jesus looking up at that roof and not seeing any faces of the people that are taking us to Jesus or not seeing our face there because we've brought somebody to him. God, give us your grace and mercy this morning and speak to us about what our next step is to bring those kind of relationships into our life real relationships that are intentional, vulnerable, and spiritually transforming. We surrender this time to you and trust that you're gonna move in our lives. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.